Welcome back. We're switching gears now uh, for this course, and we're going to spend some time talking about linear inverse problems. Um, these types of problems have many applications that we will um, explore as we develop some of the theory behind it. So the basic idea is pretty straightforward. We have the problem, some vector y is equal to matrix x times a vector x. And y is then what we observe. We're given a, and we want to find x. So we can think of y, actually, I've already got it down here. You can think of y as containing different indirect observations or measurements. In other words, we're not looking at x directly. We're looking at some function of x. It also could be a noisy version of x. We'll get into that as well later. Um, but in this case, for our matrix A, um, we might be looking at, we're looking at the projection of x onto the various um, rows of matrix A. So if we have um, m greater than n, then this is the case with uh, more observations than unknown. If we have m equals n, then the number of observations is equal to the number of unknowns. And finally, if m is less than n, we have fewer observations and unknowns. Well, let's start with the easy case. Um, for m equals n and a inverse exists, then the problem becomes very, um, I guess, trivial. Then x is just equal to a inverse y. <clears throat> but in general, it's uh, never really this easy. And if it is, um, then we are often uh, hit with other problems, such as uh, <clears throat> the number of observations or the matrix A being enormous. So in signal processing, maybe you're looking at a whole image, and you happen to have an idea what the transformation is uh, from the original one, uh, but inverting uh, a 1 million by 1 million matrix might also present a problem. So um, this particular case uh, isn't a super straightforward and likely solution. Okay, well, we'll start getting into ways of solving this later, but I first want to mention that the class notes, the the uh, PDF notes that are uploaded to the website uh, run through a variety of examples uh, that you might um, uh, applications that might come up and these range from uh, deconvolution to uh, say MRI or CAT scan type operations to um, 
signal detection, object detection, or um, anyway, a variety of different applications. You can take a look. Um, I'm going to just for illustration throw one of them in here and that is the idea of uh, deconvolution um, deconvolution is used uh, in many different circumstances so one of them could be deep blurring let's say you take a picture it happens to be a very important picture maybe of uh, um, a wedding I don't know but you've got one picture of this important event and you didn't hold the camera steady so this image is blurry can you de-blur that uh, and the answer generally is yes but so we'll get into some of those buts in just a moment another one would be digital communication so in digital communication you send um, some signal over over the air or through a wire for a long distance and due to physics and uh, physical surroundings uh, what shows up at the receiving end has now been uh, blurred in some way if it's wireless you have different um, echoes with different path lengths coming off buildings and streets and trees and anything else and so what comes now has uh, it's called a fading channel you have a variety of different echoes that spread the signal out so what may have been a nice, clean, easy to discern signal is now not. Uh, with respect to um, landline uh, communications, uh, cables actually will have slightly different frequency responses. Uh, there are responses at different frequencies, meaning that some frequencies may be delayed and attenuated slightly differently than others. And the result is that you get a spreading and a distortion of the digital signal at the receiving end. So we would like to undo that if possible. And it is possible and it's what makes um, digital communications work. But it's not uh, always easy and there can be problems with this. So for example, we have... Uh, some signal f of t it goes through a linear time invariant system I wish they were all linear time invariant and if they're not we approximate them as such we assume that we know h of t and if you're around next year i'll probably be teaching 6271 where we talk a lot about adaptive filters where you uh, estimate h of t and uh, track things like this even when it's uh, not time invariant. And our y of t uh, it's just the convolution here. So undoing this would be a good example. Now we're going to spend most of our time uh, with uh, digital uh, implementations of these types of things. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about how that might be done. But before I go on to the next page, I want to point out um, some of the problems here. And, and it can be apparent with uh, by viewing things in the frequency domain although once we once we get the, the language down to deal with other aspects of it you'll see that um, there are other ways of looking at this as well so 
possible problems. Um, since we have a convolution, we can take the Fourier transform. And one of these times I'll learn how to make a capital omega. Um, view of the problem. Like this. Well, if this is our problem, this is what we've got. And we can take this is just equal to, let's write it this way, 1 over h omega times y omega like that. Well, this works really well unless. You had an h of omega that maybe looked like this. So at this point, 1 over h omega is going to give you um, 1 over 0, um, which is dangerous. So in general, while this idea is nice, and there are situations where it works. Um, this, um, I'll just put it this way, danger. But we'll talk about this more later as we go along. OK, so uh, we have a continuous time signal and uh, a potential approach that has some pitfalls as we've just um, witnessed but um, let's look at generally how we do uh, this matrix uh, type solution if we have continuous time signals Okay, from the previous page, for this example, we have uh, h t minus tau, f of tau, d tau. So if f of t is time limited and we can write the following f of t is equal to the sum over n x of n psi n t where uh, this isn't necessarily the wavelet basis, it's just um, an ortho basis on a finite interval. So all this work um, with orthobases and um, I guess sometimes uh, difficult or crazy mathematics all boils down to we want to be able to solve these types of problems and it turns out we have some nice theory to do it and in order to solve it with continuous time signals and systems, we must first express everything uh, in terms that we can uh, use or apply. So it's starting to come clear why, to some extent, we've done some of the previous math, although it's interesting in and of itself and useful for many different things. It definitely sets uh, everything up 
for doing this. And as I've said before, when you encounter some sort of uh, expression and you're trying to prove something in signal processing, the first thing to consider is a change of variable or a change of order. So we're going to do the change of order here and we get h t minus tau psi n tau d tau. So although we're dealing with um, continuous time signals, our observation basically boils down to uh, a projection which gives us a set of coefficients Um, that are a function of time and n. You see we've got the T there, and we have the N there. Okay. So, generally, we observe samples uh, in time of Y uh, rather than um, the continuous time signal itself. Uh, and that's just a practical matter. Uh, it's hard to observe something continuous when you're dealing with um, a computer, um, since that would require uncountably infinite amounts of memory. So, generally we observe samples of y of t in time. So suppose we have M observations taken at times T equals T1 T2, okay, so notice here we're not saying um, n times some sampling period. Uh, they can be arbitrary. Then we define y of m to be y t sub m is equal to our expression from above So the projection onto our filter has a time component, and we've just sampled that as before. Uh, but we also have multiple bases that we're using to represent our space. And so the projection onto that filter is going to vary depending on which of the basis functions we're looking at. So now uh, we have uh, y of m is equal to the sum over n a m comma n x of n and our a m comma n 
basically comes from that uh, integral above is equal to h t m minus tau psi n tau d tau and that is h m project it onto psi and as a vector uh, in order for that to work we have to define where hm of t is equal to h tm minus t. So once we've defined this, uh, the problem once again becomes our now go-to favorite problem. If it's not yet, it will be soon. Equals a x. right from there. So this lecture is just to point out that um, we are it, it, we're interested in this um, linear inverse problem and although it's written as a uh, discrete time matrix type of a uh, problem it uh, using our um, various approaches can apply also to continuous time signals. In practice, I see it mostly applied to uh, discrete time signals. That's where signal processing tends to live nowadays. But it's really nice to know that this can tie back um, to continuous time signals. And sometimes the need uh, arrives definitely to do that. So we'll next time talk about methods of um, solving this particular problem.